In this unit, we're going to talk about some interventions for struggling students. First, we're going to talk about supporting students with ADHD, and then we'll talk about systems of interventions to support all students. Some of these characteristics may sound familiar to you, as we talked about some of them when we discussed students with lower working memory capacity and how sometimes those students are mischaracterized as having attentional disorders because of the overlap in behaviors. However, it's important to note that there are some differences. One of them is that students who have ADHD also struggle with maintaining social connections because of their impulsivity and difficulty controlling their actions. Due to the prevalence of ADHD, it is likely that all of you will have these students in your classroom. So, it's a good idea to know how you can support them. Since most teachers will experience children in their classes with ADHD, it's important to understand how we can support these learners. As such, we can consider interventions at the individual student level or class-wide. While individual interventions done with fidelity can be very successful, they can also be very time-consuming. For a general education teacher, this may put an extra burden on the already limited instructional time, as well as reducing the time the teacher has with other students. The other option is to institute class-wide interventions. In other words, the teacher can use interventions that will be beneficial to all students, but specifically target the difficulties that students with ADHD have. There are three notable advantages to using class-wide interventions. The first of these is that individualized interventions may be very expensive, and they may take a lot of the teacher's time. Conversely, class-wide interventions be can become part of the daily classroom routine and require little or no extra funding to implement. The third benefit is probably the most important, and that is the student or students who really need the intervention are not called out in front of their peers who they may already be struggling to connect with. Stigmatizing the differences between students is never beneficial. Pause the video and take a moment to review the list of behavioral interventions in Table 1 in the article. Be sure to note the features, the pros, and the cons. Now pause the video again and do the same thing for the academic interventions. Remember to review the features, the pros, and the cons. It's important to understand that no intervention is perfect. Some of them have drawbacks and some of them are more significant than others. It's our job to know the options and choose the best interventions for our students. Contingency management is an intervention that includes a set of consequences that are contingent on a specific set of behaviors. In other words, when students are doing what they're supposed to, then they get the positive reinforcement to increase the frequency of those behaviors. So when students are on task doing their work, they might get classroom bucks. But if they get off task, they might have to give some class bucks back to their teacher as a response cost. You may recall that we talked about response costs when we talked about operant conditioning and its use in the classroom. There's enough evidence from applied or in-classroom research showing that this strategy has positive effects on student behavior. The use of exercise balls for students to wiggle on has had positive outcomes on attention. It's essentially providing an outlet for the wiggle so that there is less strain put on the child's executive function of inhibition in trying to hold still, which allows them to focus on academic pursuits instead. The drawback to using these as a whole class intervention is that they can be rather expensive. Behavior monitoring involves students recording the frequency of agreed upon behaviors to help them recognize their own appropriate and inappropriate behavior. Because students with ADHD struggle with impulse control, they may not realize that they are not behaving the way they should be until the inappropriate action is already done. Students can begin monitoring a small group of behaviors and seeing how the recording of those aligns with what the teacher saw. Alignment, which is essentially an accuracy check, earns the student a reward. The teacher reduces their monitoring over time and eventually the student learns to manage their own behavior. A couple of things to keep in mind with this intervention is that it can take time for the teacher to monitor students, and it does require training the student to identify and monitor their correct behaviors. Peer monitoring is like having a behavior buddy. Students are trained to monitor and reinforce specific behaviors that are desirable and to help redirect their peers who are engaging in inappropriate behaviors. This can be less threatening than having students align their assessment of their behavior with the teachers and it can increase the teamwork culture in a classroom. 
It does require that the teacher take the time to properly train and support the students in an understanding of how peer monitoring should be done. Instructional choice is just that. The teacher creates a menu of two or more options for students to choose from. One way we see this intervention used frequently is through instructional centers. It is also possible to simply give students a choice in what activity they wish to complete first. However, when doing so, it's important to monitor what the students are doing and what they are completing to make sure that all of the work gets done. Instructional choice increases students' autonomy in the classroom, and this is something that's important to keep in mind when we talk about how to motivate students to learn. Class-wide peer tutoring is just as it sounds. Students are divided into dyads or triads and take turns teaching each other. There are a few advantages of this strategy for students learning. One is that it helps them stay on task in their small group and has less distractions than large group instruction or individual work time. Similarly, because every student has a role in the small group to teach their peers, they engage more and think more about the material. There's quite a bit of research on the benefit of interactive learning activities in the classroom to help all students learn, and it turns out that it can help with attentional difficulties as well. Instructional modification refers to adjusting the design or delivery of students' work according to their needs. The modifications can be applied by grouping students by needs so that we aren't creating a separate assignment for every student, but we are meeting the needs of all of our learners. We introduced this idea when we talked about students with lower working memory capacity and how we can provide additional supports for them. Some additional examples are to divide assignments into smaller chunks, give students extended time, let students listen to text while they read along, and of course, providing clear and concise directions for activities. The use of computer-based instruction has increased considerably over the years and has had some positive benefits to learning across student populations. One benefit to using the computer is that it can engage students sufficiently while also helping fill in gaps in their knowledge through interacting with the program. More and more programs are becoming adaptive so that if a student enters a wrong answer, the system will take a step back and fill in that missing knowledge. Of course, the obvious difficulty is availability of computer time for students. As more and more schools move to one-to-one -one environments, this may become a far more useful intervention for both behavioral and academic improvement. However, we still need more research into the best practices for the design and development of these programs for long-term retention. We already mentioned the benefits of using class-wide interventions over individualized, but there are a few other things that are important to keep in mind. First, these interventions must be implemented with fidelity in order for them to be beneficial and for the students to have long-term benefits from them. Certain interventions are designed to be reduced over time, but most of these should be used consistently throughout the school year. Also, when using class-wide interventions, you have to make sure that you apply the same use to every student. In other words, you can't give one student a pass because they are mostly good, but apply a consequence to others. This will cause students to lose faith in the intervention and you as a teacher. Finally, remember that all interventions are not for all classes of students. You have to identify the needs of your class and choose which intervention or interventions will work best. The second half of this video is going to talk about the second article for this unit, which is largely geared towards ways that we can support struggling students, but also identify which students need intensive support and may have a specific learning disability. You were introduced to RTI last week in the chapter about high incidence disabilities, so this week we are going to expand on that information a little bit. RTI has two primary purposes. First, to support students who are falling behind their grade level peers, and second, to help identify students who may have a learning disability. The discrepancy model was introduced last week and it essentially is a wait to fail model in which students aren't given additional support until the discrepancy or difference between IQ and achievement scores is large enough to suggest that they have a learning disability and need additional support. Well, a clear problem with this model is that if students didn't have good teachers who used evidence-based practices and didn't make sure that they were helping students develop adequate background knowledge, then the problem could be the teaching and not the students. Overall, the purpose of RTI is to support student learning. These four things are the keys to thinking about RTI and its use in the classroom. 
The RTI model can be thought of like a pyramid where the largest part or base of the pyramid is high quality instruction that's provided to all students. Students who are struggling with the core curriculum are assigned to a small group where they will get more focused supplemental instruction with their peers who are at the same or similar level. Here the teacher can fill in any gaps in knowledge that are keeping the students from moving forward with the rest of the class. The students who don't improve with small group instruction are moved into an intensive individualized instruction where they get even more instruction to help them fill in the knowledge gap that is keeping them from moving forward. Depending on the implementation at the school, students who are placed in tier three may be assessed for a learning disability or in some cases, being placed in tier three means that they are receiving special education services. One thing that is important to recognize about the RTI model is that it is designed to support learners by placing them in the tier that they need. But that doesn't mean that they are left there indefinitely. One of the great things about RTI is that students are monitored throughout using curriculum-based assessment, and as such, they can move between tiers as many times as they need. Multi-tiered systems of support can be considered an overarching term to categorize any intervention system that has multiple tiers. This can include systems for addressing both behavioral and academic concerns, and they can be used in conjunction with one another. Additionally, MTSS often refers to systems of support that are implemented school-wide. One example of a school-wide behavioral intervention that is multi-tiered is PBIS, or Positive Behavioral Interventions and Support. One thing that is essential for MTSS to be successful in helping students is data. These data are collected within the problem-solving framework so that schools are finding and correcting flaws in their system where necessary and making sure that all students are getting the support that they need. In order to do that, we have to know what students do and don't know and where they fall in relation to their peers. We already know that some students are at greater risk than others before they even start school, and that has to be a consideration along with how they are progressing through the content. Finally, we have to make sure that we apply the intervention consistently and across the student population. In other words, we can't decide to have a small group instruction for struggling students this week, but not next week. Consistency is a key to successful interventions. The purpose of MTSS is to implement school-wide change to support all students. As such, it's important to have strong support from administrators and faculty. Everyone has to be on the same page and moving in the same direction to support students. As you move into classrooms to begin student teaching and when you have a classroom of your own, remember to make sure that you find out what systems are in place to support all learners. RTI can be implemented by one teacher in one classroom, but larger systemic change like adopting MTSS school-wide requires support of administrators and peers.